We often speak about the four P's of marketing in a consumer business every time we talk about FMCG. It's price, place, promotion and product. But you know what? It's the fifth P that impacts all these four. And that fifth P is politics. The Sitapati brothers. Sudhir is an FMCG veteran and Vinay is an academic expert on politics. Between the two of them, they have three books written, all of them bestsellers and among my favorites. So it was only fair that I sat them down to discuss the impact political regimes and policies and elections have on consumption. It's important to track ahead of so many state elections and the central election next year. This is The Weekender on CNBC TV 18. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining in. Sudhir, I have to tell you, FMCG is life, but I read Half Lion much before I knew of you at HUL and thereafter at Godrej Consumer. How does that feel? Well, he's the he's the more famous Sitapati, so it's natural. And you're uh, the... Uh, <laughs> he's the richer Sitapati. <laughs> I must say that CEO Factory as a book was inspired by Vinay, so I think you should ask Vinay how he wrote Half Lion first. Speaking about Half Lion, you know, Narasimha Rao, um, not many know about the person. How did that subject fascinate you? How did you write that book? Well, so I am not Telugu and yeah. I didn't know much about Narasimha Rao other than the joke that he knew how to be silent in 10 languages, right? So these were the jokes about him. But, you know, I was doing my PhD at Princeton University and I was getting more and more interested in India changing in the 90s. Something changed. I remember standing in line when the first McDonald's came to in India in the mid 90s. So there was something there, right? And then I read a biography of Deng Xiaoping and it was a fantastic biography of Deng, his, his life and the life of China changing in the 80s. And I said, wait a minute, this is the parallel of India in the 1990s and the Prime Minister happened to be Narasimha Rao. All his negatives, his affairs, his corruption I talk about, but I also talk about the fact that in my opinion he was the greatest Prime Minister in India. And um, so I then, you know, started, you know, meeting his family after, you know, they met me many times and they said, listen, you know, finally, you know, we trust you. And his youngest son Prabhakar Rao took me to his terrace or to, to, to the rooftop which was closed to say that, look, there are about 45 cartons here. These were my father's private papers. And I sort of, you know, supplemented that with about 100 interviews. The benefits that liberalization has given us was not inevitable. And even today, as we are pushing for more economic reforms, more liberalization, technocracy ain't going to do it. So there was no new thinking in the early 90s. What was new was the political ability to implement. And I think that your viewers, especially, they focus on economics, they focus on the stock market. My only request is that don't write politics out of the story. On the other side, there was a parallel track in your elder brother, uh, who was, you know, was finding his footing in the FMCG industry at that point. What were the changes there? How did consumption pattern change during liberalization post that? You know, I joined the FMCG industry in the late 90s. And the early 2000s, paradoxically, due to liberalization, was actually a tough period for FMCG. And in hindsight, we realized that a lot of consumption went into telecom. I mean, then, of course, you know, after 2005 and 6, for a decade, there was a lot of growth in FMCG uh, and that market boomed. And things are very, very different today when I look at the FMCG industry and consumer consumption today versus what they were in 1999. Policies and politics, uh, how do they impact consumption? Do you have any empirical evidence from both your experiences on that? So, so one is, you know, are the policies pro-growth, pro-welfare? Right. So, you know, what Ravdi culture versus GDP culture. But there's a third element, which is inflation. So, you know, you can have policies that, you know, increase consumption in, say, rural areas like the NREGA did. But we also know from the UPA time that that had a huge effect on inflation. So that's the complex metrics. And even when you look at Prime Minister Narendra Modi, what he's trying to ask is, you know, should I spend on capital expenditure? Today, it may not bring benefits. Ten years from now, a highway brings benefits. How much should I spend on Ravdi? It brings me elections uh, results in the next four, five years. And in doing so, what are the consequences on inflation? And it's this complex balancing um, where politics, policy uh, and economics kind of play together that every prime minister is dealing with day in and day out. I think between 91 and 2000, the FMCG industry saw a boom. That was led by supply chain factors, licensing, you know, industry being de-licensed, you know, cost of production falling, etc. Then surprisingly, between the late 90s and 2005, 
when GDP growth went up, for a period FMCG actually saw slower growth because as GDP went up, people started consuming different things. Then for another decade, we saw a lot of broad-based growth in FMCG, perhaps to do with things like MNR, EGA, etc., etc. And over the last few years, we have broadly seen a trend of premiumization. That mean that, you know, premiumization was a function of uh, growth-related policies, capex heavy budgets, and mass consumption was a factor of, uh, you know, uh, say, the MNR, AGS scheme and people having more money in the hands. How, uh, would you... Yeah, but I think in addition to that, I think that's, that is correct. In addition, I think premiumization has to do with the fact that the state just gets out of the way. So yes, the kind, the nature of state spending, whether it's in you know capital expenditure or it's in RAVD, does make a difference in who is consuming. The core idea in 1947 was that India is backward, its villages are backward. We need a strong state in order to push India into modernity. Post-1990, the, the ideological shift, which whether you're Manmohan Singh, Narsimha Rao, Deve Gauda, um, or indeed Narendra Modi is that, look, the state has to be a supporting actor. It cannot be the primary actor in the economy. I think that itself has led to a lot of premiumization. Where we are right now, how do you view the consumer sentiment in the country at this point in time? As things stand today, I think a lot of people are speaking of the K-shaped recovery, the top 20% e-commerce, modern trade doing well, rural, small towns under a little bit of pressure. But I think it will change. I think these are all the ups and downs that you have in any business. I think the bigger story is that India has about 25 to 30 years of very, very fast consumer FMCG growth left in it, given where consumption is today. From your business standpoint, what was it that you learned from him? So, you know, if you look at his books and the way he writes his books, he writes his chapter titles first, he writes a pressy on each chapter, and then he writes the books. That's a very useful way of thinking in business, which is to have hypothesis first. A lot of us are fact first, and then you're like swimming in an ocean of facts. The other alternate approach that Vinay follows in writing books is hypothesis. You make up your mind, and as the data comes, you change your mind. So you've got to be flexible on it. You can't like make up your mind yeah, and not yeah, change yeah. your mind. You know, when I was asked to interview for Godrej, I first wrote my hypothesis down on Godrej. Got it. Then I asked Nisaba to send me some data on Godrej. Then I refined that hypothesis. Then when I joined Godrej, I spent two, three months traveling around Godrej and I refined that hypothesis. And then after I've, so I've still got that original hypothesis. The thing that I'm not sure I always do, but the thing that I certainly you have to keep in mind is that you cannot get dogmatic about yes. hypotheses. Yeah, you, cannot be, you cannot be in love with your own original assumptions. What is it that you're witnessing over uh, what's happening in the country right now with uh, from, from a Godrej business standpoint? The way we look at our Godrej businesses is regardless of the short term, providing you believe in the long term, you got to develop categories far and ahead of the natural rate of growth of those categories. And therefore, you know, what we need to do in Godrej is get this business to double digit volume growth. If India was not on a broad secular growth, then this would be different. But given the fact that you're on a broad upward trend, there are plenty of categories having lots of growth. The job in for us in Godrej is to develop categories so that we trump the economic growth uh, that is up or down in any given year. Do you think over the last few years, this job of developing categories which are likely to grow ahead of the market in general has been, uh, you know, so perhaps outsourced or taken up by a lot of the new age entrepreneurs who are looking at alternate channels, the D2C brands, etc. I would certainly say there have been many categories, a lot of them in e-commerce, D2C, technology, but also otherwise that have innovated really well and taken a share of growth. So a lot of the time we think about share of market, you have to look at share of consumption. And if you look at share of consumption, you have to innovate so that your share of wallet goes up compared to others. I would certainly say that some categories have done it much better than many categories in FMCG. What would then uh, you do to perhaps bring that growth to those categories? Acquisition was one of them. We saw that with the Raymond consumer business. But what are the other things that you're doing? Two things. One is you got to innovate and get new products out into the market. And second is you got to, after getting a new product, you, it takes a long time for it to build, you know. So you have to bet behind these innovations, which I call market development, for a long period of time for them to take off. Like a great innovation has been magic hand wash, which has been a powder to liquid hand wash. We've had recent success in a good innovation called 
cockroach anti-roach gel, which is a gel that you stick in various parts of the houses and when you come back the next morning, all the cockroaches that were there all over the house, including hidden corners, die and that's had really explosive growth. Our air care category has really ridden this theme of premiumization really well. So there are plenty of categories in Godrej and GCPL, both in India and the rest of the world, which are trumping GDP growth and growing faster than that. How important do you think is the 2024 election for you to decide where to put the next dollar in? 80% of our growth is driven by what we do and 20% is what is driven by the macro. So rather than spending all your time thinking about the macro, it is better for you to think about what you can do. The next few months have a bunch of state elections, all leading up to the big central election. How do you view, how do you view the situation right now? So I think the two ba basic changes when it comes to state versus centre. One is, especially under Mr. Modi, the two have become delinked where the central government is seen as a referendum on Modi personally. Whereas state elections are seen as much more a referendum on state issues, state performance, a lot of local level factors. So I think that's one huge delinking that has happened. So I think the big message there is that whatever the state election results, they should not be seen as a semi-final for next year because that delinking, especially under Mr. Modi, is quite strong. The other thing is that you're seeing something closer to a pro-incumbency effect than before which is unique when it comes to state elections in particular. So I would say these are the two takeaways and the big one is that don't see this as a semi-final. Think about the national elections separately and with a separate set of factors than these. Post-2014, uh, do you think the underlying uh, tonality of politics has moved? People are speaking the language of success of Mr. Modi where he speaks about development, he speaks about all these factors. Now you have other political parties speak about that as well. Yeah, but you know, I, I wouldn't put it down only to Mr. Modi. There's been a general trend over since I would say 1991, mm -hmm. where there was an emphasis that development works. I think Mr. Modi's genius is that he is the best marketeer of this product. Whereas, you know, I think other political parties, especially the Congress, are like, listen, if we talk about development too much, do we look at as pro-rich? Mm. But I think Mr. Modi's ability to give a singular message, a very clear message, is what makes him seen as Mr. Development, but frankly, it's an all-India story. And as you said, many state governments are also singing the same tune. The liberalization benefits more or less in the price, as they say in the stock market. The next leg of growth, do you think manufacturing is one of them that the, the whole make in India, PLI sort of schemes that have been announced, will that be the engine that fires the next leg of growth? Well, let me answer that question historically, Mangalam, which is that I think one of the reasons why service sector boomed post-1991 was that it required less of the state. So the IT sector broadly required the state to get out of the way. Manufacturing, on the other hand, if you looked at the manufacturing powerhouses of the 20th century, East Asia, for example, China, they've also required good state support, mm. right? The, the million dollar question in India is, is the, is the state, not the Modi government, not the state government, but the state is the, you know, the, the Mai Bap Sarkar capable of, uh, mark, you know, manufacturing friendly growth? I'm not so sure about that. And don't forget, like, you know, like, for example, the, the MITI, the ministry that promoted industry in Japan, was very efficient, very honest, and was far-sighted. Will we be able to say this about various ministries in, in the, whether it's the central government or the state government? Do you suddenly expect a joint secretary who used to revel in the license Raj to suddenly administer a PLI system better? That's where my hesitation comes from. How would you view this as a person who's running businesses? I mean, India, you know, and in particular in the context of GCPL is becoming a relatively easier manufacturing hub. We just announced uh, a large investment in Tamil Nadu. Certainly at a state level, we have been very happy with the interaction and the support that we've got from the state of Tamil Nadu. It, the, it, India definitely has some advantages in being a global manufacturing hub compared to some time ago. I think the ports work better. States are very, very sort of competitive in getting investments, so they're very helpful in getting permissions, etc. I think there's a certain amount of critical mass of skilled labor that's available in India. At the same time, labor prices are low. There is plenty of availability of a wide range of raw materials in India. I think there are a lot of stars aligning for India to be a, a, a global manufacturing hub. But on the other hand, there is a counter to it, which is manufacturing today is a lot more automated than it was in the 80s as well. So. 
So I, I don't know whether it will generate the same amount of jobs that it will that it did in the past. I don't know, and I, I, it depends on what kind of manufacturing. But I see personally from the Godrej example, a lot of you know stars aligning for India to be a good manufacturing hub. Both of you all come from different vantage points, but obviously meet at common ground, which is India right now. You see the world through uh, your business eyes. You see the world through the eyes of ac academia and. Do you really believe that the next decade or two belong to India when it comes to supernormal growth? You know, this idea of make in India was embedded into us. You know, my father, after finishing uh, his engineering in IIT Pawai, he went to New York University, but he came back to India. And my mother is a sociologist, you know, she's gone to villages in India, she understands Indian society. And from a very early age, the two of us, you know, we, for, for us, our family outings was going to an Indus Valley site, Dholavira, or going to Ajanta and Elora Caves. This idea that this is a rich and deep civilization with enormous self-correcting methods, right? That if every time we go a little bit left, little bit right, the, the society itself has a genius to it. I think that's what, you know, at least the two of us bet on. That's why I came back to India. I, you know, that's why he's had multiple opportunities to go abroad you know, to be, you know, to, to work in, comp you know, global companies. But for him, his heart has always been here. Now, Indian states, ministers may come, ministers may go, prime ministers come, prime ministers go. But I think that if you take that view of India, I think our civilization is definitely in the cusp of greatness. Any of your investors taking a long-term view, this is a civilization that is rising. And it's a country that you, therefore you should bet on. One of the things I observe when I go across the world is that Indians have a tremendous sense of entrepreneurship. You will find in Africa, in Southeast Asia, a lot of the entrepreneurs are either Indian or Chinese. That keeps the Indian market incredibly competitive. As the opposite side of it, when I look at other countries, especially in Southeast Asia, kind of discipline and uh, order and doing things in a systematic way, India is probably one notch lower than it's certainly many, many peers in even Latin America actually and, and Southeast Asia and even parts of Africa. So I think that's the pro and con of India. Tremendous entrepreneurial energy, but relatively lower regimentation, I suppose, than, than the countries that I see. More of Jugad and less of Jugalbandi is what you would say. <laughs> the title of my second book, Jugalbandi, is precisely because, and you know, this will be ironic to say, the BJP is a deeply un-Indian organization and self-consciously so. That in India, we are all prima donnas, we all want to be leaders of teams, we don't know how to work together. In that, a culture in which teamwork is emphasized is frankly un-Indian. But in that sense, it's you know funny to say, but the Congress is a deeply quote-unquote Indian organization. From a Godred standpoint, you, three key perceptions that you had uh, before you joined, which have been changed after you joined. So I think it's a highly uh, values-driven organization with unusually high governance levels, going back to some of Ines' points on being a little you know different in that sense. A history of entrepreneurship and history of innovation, history of scientific innovation and frugality in cost. These have been really good. I think the, the degree of professionalization in certain areas like technology, marketing, etc. was good but not great. And these are areas that we've focused on, which is to enable a better use of technology, the science of marketing, the science of innovation versus, you know, like the, the art of innovation. So I guess these are the areas where Godrej probably needs to get better at. What do you think then would be the risk to all this optimism that we have, not only about the consumer sentiment, uh, you know, India as a civilization and all that? Well, the one thing that keeps striking me uh, is something academics actually are not very good at, which is delivery. Like, you know, you have these policies, you have a PLI scheme in manufacturing. Can you deliver, right? And in India, it is, again, delivery, delivery, and delivery. Focus on delivery requires discipline, requires regimentation, requires listening. These are not skills Indians are famous for. What would you say from a business standpoint? You know, from a business standpoint, not, not to do with my current role in Godrej, but I worked in foods for a long time prior to that, almost a decade. And the development of Indian agriculture and food processing is very crucial. I would say 40 to 50 percent get their employment primarily from uh, agriculture, even though it's less than 20 percent as a contributor to GDP. So to crack the problem of food processing and agriculture would be a meaty, meaningful uh, challenge for uh, us going forward. India in three years, India in five years, India in ten years, in one word each. India in three years, I would say 
chaotic, but India in a thousand years as stable as it is always. Mm. Godrej in three years, Godrej in five years. Godrej in, in, in three years, I hope will be the most innovative FMCG company in India. And I hope in five or 10 years is the most innovative company that solves consumer needs across the world. Your top three prime ministers of the country. Oh, I'd certainly say Narsimha Rao is one. Obviously, you wrote a book on I'd him. I'd say, uh, you know, I, I mean, in terms of consequential, I'd say both Modi and, and Nehru would, would be number two. Both. And ironically, because, you know, they do yeah. come from vast, but in terms of remolding the idea of India to their uh, image, I would put both of them as, as strong number two. The reason I put Narsimha number one is that he inherited a lot more problems than the other two. The top three consumer companies of India, which are not HUL and Godrej Consumer. I'm a big admirer of DMART and what they have done in the, in the recent past. I've been an admirer of Nestle as well for consistent results over 20, 25 years. I've also been an admirer, I guess it's a, a bit of a cliche, but of Asian paints for what they've done to the supply chain. So I guess these are companies I'm admirers of. You know what happened the last time we spoke about different yeah, companies, yeah. right? <laughs> so you were in Unilever, you went to GCPL, and now you're speaking about Nestle, Asian Paints, and DMART. We'll keep an eye out on that, but <laughs> nothing happening in the very near future for sure, right? That's very funny. Well, yeah. Well, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> but talking about the near future, um, uh, what are you working on? You've spoken about two prime ministers, uh, rather three prime ministers, but I'm sure you would be wanting to write about others as well. Yeah, well, so I have these two projects. Uh, one is uh, for the last year I've been working on, you know, both a biography of Manmohan Singh in the context of kind of economic transformation of India. But more immediately, me and this fantastic uh, Stanford academic Dinsha Mistri were working on a, on a project on the success of Indians in America. Um, which is just, you know, just it's astonishing. phenomenal. 25 uh, CEOs is uh, what I uh, read. Uh, the list keeps updating every month or two. And the combined market cap of uh, Indian origin CEOs of the world is close to around $5 trillion. So wow. we might not have been a $5 trillion economy yet. <laughs> but in terms of Indians heading companies would be $5 trillion. Yeah. That'd and be so interesting. What's the secret sauce? What's the Brahmastra that enables this to happen? What is it? Well, that's the book. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. This was great. Thanks, I'm not Adam. letting you go thank without you. you showing me your sitar room. Sure. Thank you. All right. Let's go. Sudhir, thank you so much for doing this for us. Thanks, Mangala. I'm doing a duress. I haven't touched this instrument for a few years. It doesn't matter, but you know, the way you're holding it, it looks like you've been playing it for a very long time anyway. This wonderful place, it's, it's inspired by your love for art? Well, yeah, I mean, the name of this place is Malhar. So maybe I'll play a few strains from Rag Malhar. Let's do that. Sita Pati with the sitar. <laughs> than what you did, <laughs> it would have started raining. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. The, well, you know, we're, we're talking about the India theme, India, everything. Can you play something that encapsulates India according to you? I mean, is there a tune that you have? on that wonderful rag des note thank you sudhir thank you thanks. thank you for doing thanks this thanks so me. much